Uh, today, today's Mission Sunday, so we're going to be having some communion after the service is, is done, or as part of the service a little bit later, I should say. Um, but we're going to talk today about, about Israel, the ministry that we do for Israel. And one of the things that God was working with me on throughout, um, especially throughout this most current war that we're, that we're watching between Israel and Hamas and the area known as Palestine as well. There's a lot of political tension. There's a lot of politics that are involved. I know that. But God has also said, or yeah, he has also shared with me, um, filled in some blanks as to, to how it's gotten to this point as it is. Because sometimes when we have a problem that we're facing, we've got to figure out what the root cause is so we can figure out what the right next step is, whether it's at work or with our family members or our relationships or whatever. We've got to figure this out. Where did this, this tension, where did this conflict start? Who here knows where the, the, the history of Islam came from? Ishmael? Okay. Now, who is Ishmael? Abraham's what? Mm-hmm. Yep. By Hagar. So we're going to read through that portion of Scripture, and then we're going to go through the timeline of how we got to where we're at today. It sounds like it's going to be a history lesson. It is but it's important and it's very, very condensed. There's a lot more details. It would take a long time to go through the entire history of who did what, when, and all this kind of stuff. But we're gonna go through this because it's very important to understand why, why we support Israel, but also how we're supposed to react to those that come against Israel. This is, as Christians, Jesus tells us to love our enemies, right? supposed to support Israel as well. Israel also has enemies. So if we're supporting Israel, and Israel has enemies, we're supposed to love those enemies too. So how do we balance that out when we're supposed to support Israel in their time of need? Those are the kinds of questions that run through my mind whenever we're thinking about the war that's going on and all of the, all of the issues that have been going on for thousands of years. So we're going to go into Genesis chapter 21. Now, actually, first, first, we're going to look at this map. You've got Israel right here in this, like, a sliver of land. This is current day, okay? This, well, as of yesterday, <laughs> when I pulled it from Google Maps. This is where Israel is, right here. You've got the, the Jordan River coming down in between the the Dead Sea and the Red Sea and all these other areas. And then you've got Jordan, you've got Syria, you have Egypt, and you have Saudi Arabia. So they're surrounded, and there's Lebanon. They're surrounded by a lot of countries that have a lot of Muslim influence. Very, very heavily populated by, by followers of Islam. Okay? And in Israel, you also have some Muslims that live there as well. So. The question is, well, let's zoom in a little bit. We've got Israel here still, okay? But in the yellow areas, this is what's known as the West Bank, and then you've got the Gaza Strip over here. We hear a lot about that right now in the news, the Gaza Strip. West Bank is also very, very heavily populated um, by the Palestinians. Now. Again, we'll, we'll get into the history of where did the Palestinians come from because we know in the Bible it says that God promised the Israelites this land. Okay, So where did the Palestinians come into play? We'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But while Pastor and I were over there in Israel back in 2015, we got to travel up to Nazareth, even up here into the Golan Heights, and we got to travel to Tel Aviv. We got to go into the West Bank where Jericho is, Bethlehem, Hebron. We got to go all over the country in 
a very, very fast-paced tour. We didn't make it into the Gaza Strip that I remember because of the, the turbulence going on over there as it was. But we did go into the West Bank and um, in a lot of these areas. It's very, very heavily populated with Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And as you noticed here on the right, I put in here that Gaza is controlled by Hamas, as we've known from, especially as of late. Um, it's an Islamist uh, militant group, and that area has been under an Israeli blockade since Hamas seized control in 2007. That blockade has created a lot of social issues with um, politics and with people's lives because even though you've got millions of, of people living over here in Gaza, um, Hamas, this militant group, took control of that strip of land. And they're the ones that are the rulers of those folks right now, whether they like it or not. Israel has had dealings with Hamas in the past and decided as soon as Hamas took over that they weren't going to be doing much dealings with them directly as far as allowing free travel and all this kind of stuff because they know what Hamas's main goal is. As we've seen on the news, their main goal is to try to destroy Israel and under, undercut Israel as much as possible. So they've blockaded that, but as a side effect to that blockade, a lot of people have a hard time getting the resources that they need, the physical resources. And so that's why you've got a lot of folks all around the world up in arms throwing blame at Israel for blockading people that don't have, have a dog in the fight, right? It'd be like somebody blockading West Virginia. And it's only a select government that's actually creating this chaos. But those of us that aren't part of the government and didn't even elect that government to be in place are impacted. It'd be similar, except with bombs and with all these other things. So how did we get to this point? That's the question. So Genesis chapter 21 verses 1 through 21 says this and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken for Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him and Abraham called this, the name of his son who was born to him whom Sarah bore to him Isaac then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely Isaac, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in your for in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he's your seed. That son that they're referring to is Ishmael. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, for she said to herself, Let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. 
which makes sense since she was Egyptian. She already knew some people over there, I'm sure, and knew their cultures and their customs and found a woman who she thought would, would be a good match for Ishmael. So they've been essentially kicked out of the house from Abraham and Sarah. And so Hagar took her son over into the wilderness, over into the wilderness of Paran, and um, started their own life. He became a very good archer, started, started their own life, and God promised a nation out of Ishmael, just like he did out of Isaac, because they both came from Abraham's seed, and that was the promise that God had given Abraham. From there, uh, I had always assumed that Ishmael... Um, having lived in the household of Abraham would have followed the same God that, that Abraham did. That's what I had always assumed and still I, until I started reading through this and studying it out. And it, it could be that he did follow the same God for a while. But when you have an influence of a wife who happens to be in a different culture than what you were raised in, such as uh, Egypt, and the influence of his mother, who was Egyptian, uh, chances are he had a lot of influence from the Egyptian gods and goddesses as far as that culture goes as well, which was prevalent during that time in that area. Um, so the scripture doesn't specifically say that he was following the same God that Abraham and Isaac and Sarah had, because I'd always wondered why why do the Muslims say that they're worshipping Allah and the Jews say they're worshipping the God of, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, which is the same God that we're worshipping. There's a lot, of, a lot of people out there that think that all three of the Western religions, Christianity, Isra um, uh, Jews, and Muslims all worship the same God and that's truly not the case. Christians and, and Israelites or Jews do we worship the one true God but the Muslims don't and we're going to find out why here or how how we know that for sure here in a moment because even though they come from the same background they split off and they start having a deviation that our scripture tells us not to do and we'll get to that here in a moment so what happened to Ishmael after this. It just says right here, he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. What happens is this, in Genesis 25, just a few more chapters later, gives us the genealogy of Ishmael. So God's keeping tabs on him, just like he promised. You're going to be a nation, you're going to be a great nation. Here's what happened. Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael was Nebajoth, then Kedar, Adbeel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Massah, Hadar, Tima, Jeter, Nafish, and Kedemah. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, twelve princes according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ish Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last, last and died, and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go towards Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. Twelve sons, twelve princes, and they all spread out. As time goes on, his second born, Kedar, is actually the lineage from where Muhammad himself branches off, and Muhammad being the, the first prophet of Islam. Kedar is the father of the Kedarites, a northern Arab tribe that controlled the area between the Persian Gulf and the Sinai Peninsula. According to tradition, he's the ancestor of the Quraysh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that one, Quraysh tribe, and thus an ancestor of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Yeah, here's the timeline, <clears throat> um, starting with Abraham. Now, keep in mind, 
if you haven't seen charts like this before where they label things that say CE and BCE, I'm going to tell you <laughs> I wasn't happy to see that um, because traditionally when you look at history you hear BC and AD. BC stands for before Christ. AD is Latin which means in the year of our Lord. I don't remember the Latin because I never took Latin. But Addo denies something or other in the year of our Lord. Well, <coughs> our culture has decided to replace those, those terms, um, and they had started that well over a couple of decades ago. I learned about it in college and refused to use them. Well, now other people are using them. So BCE stands for before the common era, and CE is the common era. That's what that stands for. So when you see that, it's basically replace BCE with BC and CE with AD. So before Christ, we had Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. And roughly around 2000 BC, all the way up through a little bit closer to 1400, 1350, some, or I mean 1450, something like that, you went all the way through Moses. They were living in Egypt, and you can see the color coding here as well. Um, the, in, in this point in, their, in the history of Israel, um, they were living in Egypt, eventually as slaves under Pharaoh. As time goes on, they finally get a king, King David, right? So now they can finally say that they're self-ruling, and they were ruling themselves in Israel. It says, without a king in Jerusalem from this time all the way up until David was anointed king. And then they became an independent, <coughs> an independent king kingdom with kings ruling from Jerusalem itself from about 1000 BC up to about 600 uh, BC. And then Jerusalem was founded by David as the capital city. Solomon builds the first Jewish temple. This gives you that timeline, and we know a lot of that already from our scriptures. Then after that, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon conquers Jerusalem and destroys the city and the temple. And it's during that same time Susan was talking about uh, during Sunday school this morning. So they were conquered by the Babylonians and they lived in exile in Babylon from about 600 to 550-ish uh, BC. After that, they got to return to Israel to live as a province within the Persian Empire. Uh, underneath the Persian uh, Cyrus, who conquered Babylon. So he conquered Babylon and said, you can go back and return to Israel. So they got to go back to Israel. This is still before Jesus' time. Okay, um, They were in Israel for a couple of hundred years there. But then Alexander the Great comes along and conquers the Persians. And at his death, his empire dissolves into four kingdoms. So Israel became a province under the Greeks because that's where Alexander the Great was from, was, was from Greece. So they got to be a province instead of their own um, nation, and they had temporary independence with Maccabees, who was their, their ruler at the time, or leader, rather. And then comes the time right before Jesus, and that's when the Romans came in and said, guess what? You're now one of us. <laughs> Israel has hopped around a lot, right? They've had a lot of masters. They've had a lot of, a lot of uh, kingdoms take them over. So now they've been within the Roman Empire, and it's during that time that Jesus was born and started his ministry, and why the Jews were like, hey, we're ready to get out of here. We're, we're tired of being under all these other oppressors and all these other kingdoms. When are you going to bring your army? And well, let's get started yesterday, basically. After that, after Jesus died, rose again, and Christianity was in its still early infant stages, around 70 AD, Jerusalem is destroyed, just like Jesus said it would. Jesus, or, the Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, and the Jews were sent into the worldwide exile. Basically, go anywhere but here. That was the direction they were given. And at this point, They were in the worldwide exile for the next roughly 18 or 1900 years. It depends on who you talk to as to how long they actually were there. 18 to 1900 years. They were spread all over the world, wherever they could live. And throughout those times, 
you see stories. Who here has ever seen the musical um, Fiddler on the Roof? Okay. The background of that is they're Jews, but they live over in Russia, this particular family, and they're, they're, their hearts are wanting to go back to Israel. They can't because of the politics and things that are going on. But even in Russia, they're being persecuted. They're being looked down on. They're being oppressed. So no matter what land these Jews have been in, in Europe, Asia, wherever, they've been oppressed throughout these 18 to 1900 years, including more recent times, World War II, right? And we saw what happened with the Holocaust. It was a, a, a horrible time, a horrible exclamation point on their history. This was not the only time that they had been persecuted and gone after. <clears throat> but these are God's chosen people. They have a promise. You will return back to Israel. These, this has been prophesied. They've been waiting for that prophecy to be fulfilled. And then in 1948, it finally did. 1948, after World War II, they got to become a nation in 1948. Um, the so we're going to go back a little bit I skipped ahead by accident still in this red area between 1500 and 2000 AD around 1600 there was a rise to power of uh, the Qasimid Imam in Islam a leader is called an Imam I-M-A-M -M. so when you see that that's not necessarily somebody's name that's their title they're a religious leader within that within that uh, religion. The name <laughs> is this one, Al Mutawakil Ishmael. Well, thank you. Um, and that that guy lived from 1644 to 1676. There was a crucial turning point in the condition of the Jews living under the Imamate Kingdom of Yemen. Yemen's a country. He endorsed the most hostile policies toward his Jewish subjects. Partly, and I highlighted these partly due to the claim that the Jews were aiding the Ottoman Turks during the local uprising against them. See, even in the 1600s, Jews had people shifting blame on them for things that they may not have had anything to do with. One decree led to another. The king initially demanded their conversion to Islam, and when they refused, he made them stand out in the sun without any apparel, so naked, for three days, which was later followed by harsher decrees. It's said that this guy consulted with the religious scholars of Islam and sought to determine whether or not the laws concerning Jews in the Arabian Peninsula applied also to Yemen, citing Muhammad, who was reported as saying, there shall not be two religions in Arabia. When it was determined that these laws did indeed apply to Yemen, since the country was an indivisible part of the Arabian Peninsula, it then became incumbent upon the Jews living in Yemen to either convert to Islam or leave the country. So this was the first, I, I wanted to find out when was the biggest point where Islam was coming after Jews. We know that that happens now, but when did it first start and why? Those were the questions I was asking God. And he, he helped me find this. This is the earliest point where Islam has, has, has it documented that Islam was... Uh, specifically targeting Jews on a wide scale. And so they started kicking them out unless they converted over to Islam. And part of the reason for that logic was that Muhammad right here was reported as saying there shall not be two religions in Arabia. Muhammad, for those that don't remember, um, he had, again, he was in the lineage of Ishmael, like we already established. He had a vision this is what he's told people. He had a vision that the angel Gabriel came down to him and said, here are the rules that you need to live by. You need to follow one God, which was different than the culture that he was living in at the time because you had a lot of poly polytheistic, many, many, many gods in the religions around him. And this, this visit from the angel Gabriel, so he says, told him you need to worship the one true God and that name is Allah and here are the laws that you need to start passing down and everything like this now Muhammad 
decided not only to do that, he started talking to people and telling people about that. He didn't have any tablets like Moses did, right? He had this vision that he was trying to convince people about. Along with that convincing came military, and he became very violent and would and try to convince people to join Islam, following the one true God, and if you didn't, then there was going to be some violence. And he had an army. He had this huge, powerful army as time went on. And at this point right here, it says there shall not be two religions in Arabia. That tells us right there his intention was there needs to be only one religion, and that religion is Islam, which points out the fact that he doesn't agree. The founder of Islam doesn't agree that they worship the one same God as the Jews. If you did, then why would there be two religions? We're not talking denominations, we're talking religions, okay? Also, in the Quran, which is the holy book of Islam, in the Quran, it specifically states that they, uh, that they follow and believe in the one true God who does not, and it specifically says, does not have any begotten children. Our scripture says God has one begotten son. One son that he gave, that he came, came through. Islam says their God has no son, has no children, no begotten children. So there, is, there are two points now, one from Muhammad there and one through the Quran, that points out these have to be two different gods, Allah and the God that we worship. Now, um, so that was the first major scene of anti-Semitism that I could find. Um, let's go on here. So now we're back to this map. The reason why I wanted to point this map back out is because the, the location of Israel is right here. What, what Muhammad said here on this previous slide, there shall not be two religions in Arabia. What we now know today as Saudi Arabia is right here. But at the time in the 1600s, which is when Muhammad was around as well, at the time, Arabia included all of this land, it included Jordan, it included Syria, and it included the Sinai Peninsula, which is part of Egypt. It included all this area. And at that point, this sliver of land that Israel belongs in now was in this was in this mix so all of this was Arabia and he said no there shall not be two lang two uh, religions in this land so it included all of that including Yemen which is what the uh, previous slide was talking about trying to figure out is Yemen actually included in that area and it is so you that's why I've got the map back there again because Muslim or I mean uh, Islam was trying to get the Jews out of that land, even as, as recently as the 1600s and all the way up to today. So, flash forward to the, we were talking about um, World War II, we were talking about 1948. I know this print is small, so I apologize, but we're gonna read a little bit of history here. So from 1920 to 1946, there was a British mandate. Under the terms of this mandate, Britain's principal obligation was to facilitate the implementation of what was called the Balfour Declaration of November 2nd, 1917, which was after uh, the First World War. Uh, it says it pledged and committed the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. That started in 1917. That was the pledge that was given to the Jews. Didn't create a new nation yet, but that was the pledge. Then from 1922 to 46, in July of 1922, the British dis divided Palestine into two administrative districts. So let me pause right there. So while the Jews were out all over the world and not in the nation of Israel that we know of today, other people moved in. It wasn't like there was a closed for business sign on the land or anything like that. Other people have lived there since the Jews were kicked out because it was good land. Those people that have been living there for the last 18 or 1900 years 
are known as Palestinians because that was the nation, or not nation, that was the area of labeled as Palestine. So in 1922, the British divided Palestine into two administrative districts. Jews would be permitted only in the west side, which is east of the Jordan River. And in 1946, 24 years later, the British had partitioned Palestine and created an independent Palestine Arab state called Transjordan before it ended up being called Jordan. So if you look at this map again, you can see what we're talking about here. This is Jordan, right here. And then you see the West Bank, and we'll go back to that here in a moment. November of 1947, uh, the General Assembly of the United Nations voted with a two-thirds majority to partition Western Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state. This part here, Western Palestine, west of the Jordan River, that was what was voted, was to have a two-state system. And you hear about that now in today's news a lot, where they're saying we need a two-state land or two-state agreement versus one state. At that time, in 1947, the Arabs rejected it. The, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Amin al-Husseini, stated, I declare a holy war, my Muslim brothers. Murder them, murder them all. The Muslim leader of the Arab state at that time said, Holy War time, 1947. A lot of folks still follow that direction. May 14th, 1948, Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, I can't remember how to say his name, Gurion maybe, read the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. That's the date they became an independent state. It's 1948. They had the War of Independence. Uh, the Arab neighboring countries refused to accept that Israel was an independent state. In the following 30 years, five wars would follow. Uh, the Independence War started May of 1948, less than a day after the declaration of the State of Israel. The armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq attacked the small state of Israel. In 1949, the war came to an end. Israel signed a suspension of arms with Egypt, which meant no peace, just a suspension of arms. And after that, hardly one day passed without any clashes. A ceasefire also followed with Lebanon, as well as with Jordan. Syria was the last country to lay down its arms and retained the Golan Heights, uh, which was that northern portion that I mentioned the pastor and I got to go into. Israel's goal was to come to a peace agreement with its neighboring countries, but this was not the idea of the Arabs. They refused to acknowledge the Jewish state. The United Nations, though, did. Like, the world decided, yes, we recognize you, Israel, as your own independent state, even if the Arab nations don't. So then, just before and during the independence war, from 1948 to 49, a lot of the Palestinian Arabs, about 650,000 people in total, fled the land. They skedaddled out. These were different groups of Arabs, each with their own reason to leave the country. The great Mufti of, of Jerusalem, who collaborated with the Nazis and the governments of the Arab countries, incited many Palestine Arabs to abandon Israel and to go to the Arab neighbors, which were Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. The refugee problem was, and still is, very complex, and it, is, it remains a major issue in the negotiations for peace. This was written prior to the current war that we're, we're seeing happening over there since October 7th. So in other words, if we go back to the map again, Israel's surrounded by a bunch of countries that do seriously want to see harm come to them. They want them out. If we put ourselves in the people's shoes that have been living there for 18 or 1900 years, you could see why there would be some concern, right? You have, suddenly there's a war, suddenly this land that my generation and my great-great-great-great-great-grandfathers have all lived in and we've developed our family history in this plot of land, suddenly you're telling us we gotta get up and move. That's basically what happened. That's why a lot of Palestinians are upset with Israel. 
to this day. And why the Muslims are saying that Israel is the bad guy. God's word tells us that Israel was promised, that land was promised to the nation of Israel, to, to God's chosen people. So when we have conversations with people about who's right and who's wrong, it doesn't need to be who was there first, because obviously the Jews weren't there first either, right? We know that from the scripture. What's important is who God promised that land to. That's where that line needs to be drawn. Regardless of who has lived there the longest, God promised the land to them. And currently, Israel doesn't doesn't want to kick people out of those boundaries. And we know that because the only people, the only groups of people that they've been wanting to, to push out have been the terrorists, like Hamas and Hezbollah and all these other militant groups that are creating chaos. <laughs> what nation wouldn't want to get the chaos out of their country? The people weren't the problem. It was the militant groups that were run by some of the people that were. And that's what they've, they've pushed out beyond the borders. But the challenge is those militant groups said, okay, we're gonna take over this, this piece of land now that you've, you've shoved us over. We're gonna take over this called the Gaza Strip and rule over the people that you say you wanna be peaceful with. And you see everything that's going on now. So that's what's going on over here in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank we've got a lot of Palestinians still living there as well but they're living there primarily in peace in in the West Bank certainly not in the Gaza Strip right now not in peace because of all the conflicts going on but in the West Bank Mary and I have uh, a guy that we follow on YouTube and on social media who <coughs> um, is what people call a, uh, an influencer, right? They, they create little videos and things and talk about stuff. He happens to be from Israel and he lives there in Israel. He and his wife uh, will post things from time to time talking about how Israel is, prior to the war, Israel is a peaceful place to come visit and he'll show videos of him walking down the streets and talking to people that are Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. He himself is Jewish by uh, nationality. I don't know if he's converted over to Christianity or not, but he certainly doesn't have anything bad to say about Christianity. He has concerns over conflicts that are happening across the, across the whole nation, but he, he's a very good guy to watch, to, to get some first-hand experience or understanding of what's going on over there. Um, he's met with Netanyahu, he's met with a number of leaders as well because of this influence that he has in, in the social media, he's been able to have those platforms to, to proclaim peace even when there's conflict going on. And um, so that's how I know that Israel itself, the official stance is we should be able to live in peace together in the same area. You've got the um, Dome on the Rock, or Dome of the Rock, right? According to our word, according to God's word here, the Dome of the Rock is traditionally the place where um, Abraham went up to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. That also happens to be the same place where uh, Muhammad had received a revelation from I don't remember if that one was from Gabriel or directly from Allah or whom. So both Muslims and Jews and Christians, as a subsequent um, trail there, perceive that one same mount as holy because it's got a lot of historical significance to, to all three religions. And so while there could be a lot more tension and a lot more conflict there at that hill, when we were there, it was, it was peaceful. At that time, Christians weren't allowed to go up there and go actually visit it. But we weren't shooed away from being able to stand there and look at it. We just weren't allowed in it at that time, in 2015, because of the politics and stuff that were going on. 
So there's a lot of intentional aim for peace. But when you have militant groups that are stirring up the pot, just like anything else, it creates problems. So, I say all this to tell you, this is where a lot of that history has come into play and why we're seeing a lot of the things that we're seeing now. But one of the ministries that we support as Spirit Life Fellowship is Ministry to Israel. And it's headed up by Daryl and Majel Stapleton. And they are from the Beckley area. Um, they are actually the ones that helped organize the trip for Pastor and me to go those number of years ago as well. And they typically will go two or three times a year over to Israel after raising some funds and hand deliver the cash directly to the people that need it. One of their tours got put on pause because of this war going on. One of the tours is scheduled for April may be put on pause as well because of this war that's going on currently and may still have some residual impact at that time of the year next year. So the questions have been raised. If we're sending money to this ministry for Israel, what's being done with it if he can't take it over there personally? So I called him up the other day, um, a couple of days ago, and had a conversation with him. And he, <laughs> he assured me that uh, he still has two contacts over there, personal contacts, and he's able to Western Union the money directly over to them for them to be able to hand to the people that need it. One of the things that he said that, that kind of surprised me but then suddenly made sense was with all the homes being destroyed, with all the bombs and things going on, a lot of people don't have places to store things anymore. Hotels are packed to the brim with refugees that are needing places to stay. And so when people have good hearts and they want to send blankets or, or teddy bears for the kids and all this, just like our hotel rooms, there's not a lot of room to keep these things in there. So the biggest need for the populace there is actual cash, is money, because they can use that just like we can to buy what they actually need, whether that's food or transportation to get from point A to point B or whatever the case might be. So he said there's a lady there uh, by the name of Yael Hazan, and this is a different Yael than what we, what we met when we were over there in Israel. Uh, turns out there's two different Yael's, but this Yael um, actually takes money over to the Israeli Defensive Force, the IDF, directly to the military, to the soldiers, because a lot of the families and the kids already have a lot of international support as it is. We've got a lot of these groups going in there and helping out. So she said, or he was telling me that she said that she noticed that the soldiers themselves don't have a lot of people coming to help them. And they're out on the front lines and doing things and they need things, but they don't necessarily need blankets and teddy bears, right? They need cash. They need something to be able to get the things they need at that moment. So um, what she's doing is she has somebody that's directly embedded within the IDF that she can take the money to and take care of that situation. Um, Last month, I think it was last month, he said, they sent $4,000, 4000 US dollars over for that effort. They, they were able to gather up that money. And it's not just from one person or two people, it's from us and a lot of other groups and individuals that want to donate money towards this ministry. It gets over there to them via Western Union. And he said he can get it over to them, give them a a confirmation number and within a day they've got the money right there. The biggest need is um, is the cash like we said. Uh, he said that West Bank which we were just looking at let's go back to it real quick. West Bank uh, is also known as Judea and Samaria. This is what the politics call it right now is West Bank. In the Bible it's Judea Samaria, the same areas. Uh, he said that's also an area that's being heavily supported. They use the money for support because products are boycotted from that area if they're actually uh, made by Jews. And that's been going on for the last few years. In other words, 
Jews that are making products, making food, making whatever, can't sell outside that border a lot of the times because companies and other nations are boycotting them, saying, you're creating chaos, Israel. You, uh, uh, we're not going to buy your products. So they don't have anybody to buy their products from them. So some of this money is actually going in to help buy those products as well. Um, I asked him specifically, with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, how do I word this right, Lord? Um, skewing in the news media, whether it's Fox, CNN, NBC, ABC, we don't always get a direct storyline. Sometimes it's skewed to different agendas, right? So I asked him, what is it that you're using to follow up on Israel and what's going on over there that you trust? Because some of these, and I've watched them, whether it's Fox or any of the ones that I've labeled, I know that I have to take it with a grain of salt and say, Lord, help me understand what the truth actually is, because they're coming from different perspectives, and we need to know what the reality is. He said there's a, um, a news station over in Israel called I-24 News. And it's the letter I-24 News. And he said you can download it free for, as an app on your phone. You can download it on your computer. And I tested it out on our TV at home. We have a smart TV, so you can download it on, on the smart TV. And it gives you news articles, news, news stories um, that are live, that are right there, and that are from folks that are actually embedded in this, in this war and telling you about what's going on. Yes, it's going to be from Israel's perspective because that's where the source is. Uh, but it gives you that first-hand perspective rather than filtered through, hey, this isn't politically correct to say A, B, or C, and all this kind of stuff. So if you're interested in knowing more about where to find that, again, it's I-24 News. He said it's a news station based in Joppa. And I don't think I've got Joppa on the map here. Um, but it's interesting, and uh, I'm learning the navigation of that app uh, as I go along. He also said there's, there's an app if you want to download it. It's called Red Alert, and that app will tell you any time and every time any rockets are fired and we're over there. And it will set off an alert on your phone every time to give you an idea, a hint of how frequent these things are. And it's an app that folks over there can download as well to know, okay, we've got one that's incoming, and it works in conjunction with their local alarm systems too. So that one's called Red Alert. And it's easy to find as well. I was able to find it real quickly on, on, on the Google Play Store. But those are, oh, and also, um, I decided to figure out how, how heavily populated are the Palestinians when it comes to um, Islam. In other words, what percentage of Palestine, or the Palestinians, are Muslim versus Christian versus Jews. According to the Palestine, or Palestine Children's Relief Fund's website, I went to that yesterday, 98%, 98% of Palestinians are Muslim. We've got a lot of praying to do. We've got a lot of people that need Jesus. We've got a lot of people, including the Jews. We don't want to forget that. Traditional Jews believe Jesus was a good teacher, and that's it. They don't believe him as the Messiah yet. They don't believe the Messiah has come yet. Because they're looking for the warrior that the traditional Jews were looking for back then, too, 2,000 years ago. So we've got a lot of people to be praying for. We've got a lot of people that we need to be supporting. And we also need to do it in the right balance. We don't need to be saying, hey, I support Israel and down with Palestine because those are our brothers and sisters potentially that still need to be hearing about Christ. We still need to be reaching out to those folks too. So there's, there's got to be that delicate balance in supporting Israel, loving the people no matter what country or what religion they're from, or they practice rather, um, and asking God for opportunities to share Christ with them because he wants them to. He created them just like he created us in his own image. So 
that's the that's the mission Sunday message here. We need to we need to be praying. We need to be asking God for wisdom on what we can what we can do and how we can support. But rest assured at the same time that this particular ministry that we that we have here at Spirit Life Fellowship ministry to Israel is still being actively used and successfully so. Um, it's not just being stockpiled until borders open up again and they can travel. They, they, they've got that direct route. So 